Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. I'll tell you what, net zero is not going to happen. If that is a shock, you haven't been listening to the podcast. The only way that we are going to get to net zero is with nuclear. And I am visiting with a world traveler right now. I've got a friend of the show. I've got Doug Sandridge. He is the head cabano over there at Oil and Gas Executives for Nuclear. And he's in Norway right now. Welcome, Doug. And thank you for stopping by the podcast. I am honored to be considered a friend of the show. That is fantastic. I love it. I'll tell you what, you and I had so much fun at NAPE, at the live event there. That was such a great time. Thank you. Tell me what you got going on in Norway. Well, so let's start as kind of backtrack a little bit and set the stage that, you know, Norway following World War II was a a fairly poor country. They had not discovered oil. They were still reeling from the after effects of the war. Most of the men had died during the war. And, you know, you have a right. country of women and fishermen. And I moved here when I was seven years old. My dad was a geologist and he worked offshore in Norway in the North Sea trying to find oil and gas. And the reality is, is, you know, they drilled all the companies together, including Phillips and Exxon and Elf and Agip, they all drilled 200 dry holes before they discovered oil in the North Sea. And then, as you know now, uh, Norway is the, the huge big hitter. They are the one of the richest countries in the world, and they produce millions of barrels of oil, and they're, they're a huge player on the, on the oil scene. Uh, and as, as a side note, this week, Norway's production, three years ago, Doug, they were shutting down their biggest fields mm -hmm. because of the green movement against natural gas. This past week, they have boosted their output in Norway to one of the single largest producers in the area, to the UK, to Brussels, to all of the other areas. They'd be dead meat without Norway's natural gas. They would. And they have made a complete turnaround from five <laughs> years ago. They have. And they've had some energy sobriety. They, they've become energy sober. And they realize what a great line, Doug. Energy <laughs> sober. I like that. They're energy sober, and you know, they are very clean over here. They have the highest penetration of electric vehicles of any nation. You know, they're very conscious, but they know oil and gas drives their economy. And so right. they're, they're back on. So here here's the deal. In 19, I moved over here in 1966. My dad worked offshore for two years drilling dry holes in the right. North Sea before we moved. And we moved to the Netherlands, and it wasn't for another year and a half after that before they finally discovered the first commercial oil field in Norway, which is the Ecofisk field, which is still producing, and the right. government has just, just extended their license to produce, I believe, until 2048. So <laughs> it's going to be almost 100 years. So they, they, they found this field, and then they started, you know, the Norwegians didn't know anything about oil and gas production. And so right. it was all the American companies, a few French and English companies that came over here and taught them the trade. And they were very astute, very fast learners. Right. Immediately, the Norwegians became some of the premier oil and gas people in the whole world. Their, their technology, their offshore technology is, you know, not not surpassed by anybody. They are they are state of the art. So. They have this oil and gas technology conference, offshore technology conference that's been going on for 50 years. This is the 50th nice. year. They started in 1974. So Ecofist was discovered in 1969. And by 1974, they realized they needed to have an oil and gas technology conference. And so right. for most of that 50 years, it's been only an oil and gas technology conference. For the last few years, they have increased that. And now they have offshore wind and hydrogen and right. carbon capture technology. So all of the, the whole, all the flavors of, of energy are represented here, but it's, it's traditionally and still an oil and gas technology conference. And they've never had anything about nuclear energy ever before. But what happened is a friend of mine, who's now a friend, he wasn't a friend then, but a friend of mine now, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the university here had been studying he actually has a background in hydropower 
but he, but Norway, he realized that they're going to need more power, and they they're out of hydropower. They don't have any more to develop. And right. he says, "What are we going to do?" And he had the conclusion that Norway needs nuclear energy. And so oh. so he he started. To, so he went to the the organizers of the of the event and said, "Hey, we need to include nuclear in this offshore technology event." And they mm-hmm. said, "You're right. We're gonna. It's totally great." We're going to have nuclear energy. Why don't we have some panels? Why don't we have some people come discuss it? And right. All that sort of stuff. Give speeches. Well, then my friend Martin, and and I'm going to let you talk to him here in a few minutes. Oh, cool. Uh, and, and he, but I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect him by saying it incorrectly. But he started looking for people to talk about nuclear energy. And the problem is it's so, has been so taboo in right. Norway to talk about it. They, people won't even talk about it, not publicly. And there's wow. this huge wave of people the public really wants is is yearning for nuclear power, but the government is is really anti nuclear, and the a lot of the business people, even though they wow. are privately in favor of nuclear energy, they can't come out and say. So he's he's sitting here trying to put together panels to talk about nuclear energy, and the first three people he asks from Norway say, "No, I can't. I can't talk about it publicly." So somehow he finds my name. And calls wow. me, and, and I happen to be on vacation with my mom and wife in Sicily, and I get a phone call from this guy, and he wants to know if I'll come to the conference and talk about nuclear. So I said, heck yeah, let's do it. So that's why I'm here. We're here. How and fun. They have embraced it so much that the first day of the conference, they called it Nuclear Monday. And no you, cannot, you cannot believe the, the turnout they've had for nuclear I, energy. I, I wonder if he's, uh, have you run into or heard Thomas Jam? from copenhagen atomics they are building modular reactors over there in copenhagen yeah no i i know of them but i don't i've never i've never met them so i I oh that's too bad because you know it's right around the corner (laughs) yeah and he might be here for all i know right so so they had they had four events the first day where they had panel discussions a lot of the people on those panels were from the u.s in fact one panel i spoke on i think all but one of the people on the panel were Americans. And wonder, then did you see Grace Stanky from there? No, I did not see Grace. Is she oh, here? She's probably she had, probably has to work now. Uh, yeah, I doubt it. So it's it's been a true labor of love. And I cannot believe the amount of support we are seeing for nuclear energy. There's a, a company here. I, I won't butcher the Norwegian name for it, but it's basically Norwegian Nuclear Company. And it's recently been started by a gentleman who owns an oil company and he owns an oil company and he started this nuclear company and you know, they're just, they're not making any money. They're not building anything. They're trying to figure out how are we going to bring nuclear to Norway? Well, he agreed to sign our old declaration of oil and gas executives in support of nuclear energy right there. And for our podcast listeners, both Doug and Doug (laughs) sent me a shirt because being an oil and gas executive, I signed the declaration and I've got a beautiful shirt. And I just want to let you know, my wife hates this shirt because it is my favorite shirt. And she always has to wash this thing. So, well, I might need to get you a new one. And Martin, my host here, you know, you can imagine a town of 140, 150,000 people when they ship in 60 or 70,000 people for a conference it's right. a little t- tough to get a hotel room and if you can get one it's going to be very expensive right. so the the gentleman who asked me to come he said i know you're going to have trouble finding a hotel wow um, and since i'm asking you to come for free why don't you come stay at my house so i've stayed all week with him how and, cool is that and he's wearing his sh- his oil and gas executive for nuclear shirt today as well oh so sweet you, when you talk to him you'll get to see his as well so it's so we had these we had these meetings we had these these panels a lot of americans here supporting nuclear energy in norway and it's funny because a couple of these panels well every panel i went to was literally completely packed every seat was filled standing room only people standing outside the door standing oh. side trying to listen and then i remember sitting there for one panel that i was not on a different panel and right after that everybody got up to leave and then the next panel was about offshore wind and the room was only half full people have this yearning right now in norway for nuclear energy so it, it was it was it's been 
fabulous. So back to back to the signing of the declaration. I've been trying to get some nuclear executives in Norway to sign the declaration. And again, we're not out to get signatures just for the purpose of getting signatures. We're getting signatures because that that adds power to the message. Absolutely, and we, will, it does. and we want to use the message for beneficial reasons. And want to, you know, this is exactly the reason we want to have this organization so that we can come out and bring gravitas to the argument to the Norwegian people, the politicians. But I was having trouble finding yeah. oil and gas executives to sign this because everyone in Norway is afraid that they're going to say wow. something and the government's going to come down on them or they're going to be persona non grata. But we had we found two executives who wanted to sign it today. So we had a little signing ceremony. And while we were there, we had two other executives walk up and sign it while wow. we have the ceremony. So it's been a huge success. And I mean, I just can't say enough about how gratifying it is to be here to, to talk. To but you know, the, 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 the worldwide message around nuclear has to get there. We will not make it to net zero without nuclear. We won't make it to net zero without natural gas. So Norway being right where you're at. With natural gas critical for the EU and nuclear is huge for them. I've just been told that a fifth signature is coming up to sign here in just a minute. Nice. So, so here's the here's the deal with, with Norway. It's very interesting. I was, if you re recall, I was in Berlin in 2021. Mark Nelson and some others had encouraged me to go. We're not going to say protest. We went to rally in support of the German nuclear plants. And the fact was they were shutting down these plants. It was total insanity. I mean, total insanity to you're trying to decarbonize your, your economy and you're closing down these cathedrals of clean energy. And the so I went. The deindustrialization, Doug, Germany is pathetic. It's, it's, it's sad. And, but I was in Berlin and I remember meeting a guy there from Norway who was just sitting here a few minutes ago talking to me, oh, but we were, we were reminiscing. I met him in Norway and my initial reaction was, cause we had people from all over the world there at the rally of support in Norway. Right. And, and when I met this guy from Norway, I was like, this is he's some young kid who doesn't have anything better to do than promote nuclear energy. Because why would Norway need nuclear energy? I mean, right. what, I mean, honestly, I sit here. They have a an embarrassment of riches. The the most oil and gas wealth in the in the Europe. They have offshore and onshore wind capabilities. Right. They have ninety percent of their electricity is produced from hydropower. They've got it all. But this is what's happened. Norway has been the model citizen for decarbonization. 80 plus percent, 85, 82, 85 percent of the cars that are being sold in Norway are electric. They, they, are a, they are a model for modern electrification, but they have been able to do this because they're also blessed with hydropower. Hydro, you know what? We could be a model of decarbonization in, in Texas if we had the resources, hydropower resources in Norway, but we don't. Right. And so they they have they have done a great job, but here's the problem. They've decarbonized everything. They have everyone driving electric vehicles, and now they don't have enough electricity. Right. And and they are smart enough to realize that they cannot do it with wind and solar. They don't have good solar resources up here at the Arctic Circle. Oh. And the people in Norway do not like wind. They despise the wind. And so now people are starting to look around and say, what are we going to do? And so they are now taking a serious look and saying, as you said, nuclear is the only way, not right. only for a country as rich as Norway with all their hydro wealth, they, even they recognize they can't do it without nuclear. So the rest of the world has to have nuclear and yeah. Norway set an example. You know, the sad part is, Doug, is France was so, you know, the nuclear fleet for the U.S. is what, 109 Ooh. reactors or something like that? Yep. France is about 50 reactors, but I believe France is only running at 50% capacity because they've not put the money back into the maintenance of these things. They have not done a good job, although I'm told that yep. they've got a, a renewed vigor. They are nice. They are improving their operational skills. They're improving their their capacity run times. They are, you know, they're going to build another six to twelve plants in the next twenty years. So they're committed. That is fabulous. They're committed to it. Doug, let me ask this: How are we going to get? We have zero big reactors in the U.S. right now. 
Yeah. How do we get over this? Because we only have, I believe, three modular reactors in process ready for fuel in the U.S., one of them being at Abilene Christian. And and they're waiting for fuel. And Senator Ted Cruz has to get involved in order to get them the dang fuel. Yeah. I just visited with Liz Miller, a founder of Deep Isolation, a, yep. a firm to working on getting spent fuel storage taken care of. That's a huge problem. How do we get past those two issues? <laughs> well, you know what? It, I didn't know you wanted to do a three-hour podcast today. I mean, there's a lot to, there's a lot to do with that. Uh, you yeah, you, you because, and I could talk for days. <laughs> you know, I think there's some things coming down the pike as far as large nuclear coming down the pike here in the, in cool. the U.S. I mean, people aren't going to announce them right away and and but i'm hearing there's some really good things there's nice. going to be there's going to be some a large gigawatt scale nuclear reactors that are going to be built in the u.s and i'm i'm hearing nice. there's some new tax legislation that's going to come out that's going to help that as well and i think you're going to see you know private industry like amazon right. and the big users they're going to torque the regulators and get them involved. They're going to make this happen. So I think it's going to happen. It's, it, you know, I know it seems like nothing's happening right now, but, but as, as the old analogy I've used before, this is, there's a duck sitting on a river, but he's sitting still, but you don't realize how much he's paddling underneath the river to keep him in that same spot. And I think right now there's a lot going on in nuclear that, that people don't see. I'm very optimistic that we're going to get some more big reactors built in the U.S. And I am absolutely convinced in the next five years, we're going to start to see some of the SMRs and micro reactors coming on as well. I sure hope we can do as good as the UAE did. And the UAE with their reactors providing, what, 25% of their, their, and they've got their second half of that on the UAE coming online. Hats off. Four years under budget and on time. Nice. Yeah. That's the so, way it should be done. Yeah, I'm I'm an, I'm I'm enthusiastic. And here's one thing. We're not gonna go deep dive into into nuclear waste, but nuclear so called nuclear waste or spent nuclear fuel right. is often used as a reason why we don't do more. And in, for instance, there's a lot of states like California who who prohibit new nuclear to be constructed until the so called nuclear waste issue is solved. And so of course we don't have we don't have the repository out in in Nevada that we worked on for many years. But here's what I'm being told, that a lot of these new, especially micro reactors and small modular reactors. So, so a lot of these advanced nuclear reactors, the SMRs and these micro reactors are use repurposed fuel. So we have <clears throat> the, the spent fuel that's sitting at all, all these locations across the country. And we're going to reprocess a lot of that fuel. And I'm being told by people at the Department of Energy and in the nuclear industry that we're really not going to need a permanent repository for spent nuclear fuel for a probably nuclear fuel argument. It's not there. It's, it has nothing to do with the nuclear fuel for the future. We're, all, these, all these small modular reactors and micro reactors are going to use the spent fuel. They're going to recycle it and reprocess it and reuse it. And right. they're going to reuse it over the next 50 to 70 years. So we're not going to really have a need for a permanent repository for nuclear waste for another 75 years. Right. So that, that argument that we can't build nuclear reactors now until we figure out the, the waste issue is total. It's, it's, it's a smoke screen. It's a red herring. And I, I couldn't agree more. The the waste, like Thomas Jam over at Copenhagen Atomics, their thorium modular reactors, I talked to him two years ago, and they are coming online. They're going to be building these things, and yep. they're using spent fuel. Yep, exactly. So we've got to educate people now to say, don't, that's, that's, that maybe was an argument five years ago, 10 years ago, but now with all this advanced nuclear technology, that is just not right. even an argument anymore. So I am so enthused by what I'm seeing going on in Norway. And this is exactly why we formed this organization, to provide a, a, a way of assisting these types of causes. So yes. we, got our, we got ourselves in the door in Norway because of this organization. And now we're opening up conversations with people who probably otherwise would not even have conversations. And, and I think it's kind of like when you mentioned Chris Wright, 
And Chris Wright was sitting there going, "I it, people don't associate oil and gas loving a nuclear. I We love nuclear as oil and gas executives because we're about energy, clean energy. And good, reliable energy. But here's something else that people don't think about. And this is what why it's so it, why it's touching such a great nerve in Norway is oil and gas companies are very likely to be the best companies that are capable of developing nuclear energy in Norway and other places because they have supply chain skills. They have project oh. management skills. They have research skills. They have manufacturing skills. These projects are huge. It takes a huge set right. of skills and who better than the people who put drilling rigs out in the middle of the north sea and right. do it safely and environmentally responsibly these are the same type of skills that will be necessary to Isn't build nuclear great? power plants so i think you're going to see people in norway com- Nor- norwegian service companies and oil companies who nice. are actually going to be the leaders of developing the nuclear energy because they have the requisite skill sets to do that isn't that fun? Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, you know, congratulations, Doug, on your on everything that you got going on out there. Yeah, I still have my real job, which I have to attend to. But uh, this is a it is a, a, a fun labor of love, and it's it's great to ha- have you people like you interested in what we're doing and and supporting the cause. I mean, we all got to get the word out uh, on these issues. Oh, I I love being. I think I'm your second biggest cheerleader out here, <laughs> besides my wife. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, but either that or Chris Wright. I'm not sure. Oh, no, stop! I have Martin here, who is he's the guy who had the original idea of bringing nuclear energy to this conference, Ace. and he's the he's the one who said let's bring nuclear energy to this oil and gas conference. And he's the one who called me because he couldn't find any Norwegians willing to talk about nuclear energy. Okay. I would love for you to meet him and have an opportunity to just chit chat with him a little bit. You, you can talk to me anytime. You can, you need to talk to Martin. Oh, absolutely. That'd be great. All Tell right. Let me see. Let me see if Martin will let me bring him in. Well, Martin, how are Hello. you today? Uh, I'm good. I'm hey. good. Thank you. What hey, about I- you? I love your shirt, by the way. Thank you. Dog gave it to me. Well, at least stay over in here. So that was very kind of him. Uh, It was very nice meeting you. And I am so excited. Tell me about how you got this portion of the energy conference fixed up. Yeah, no, well, so uh, this is a bi-yearly energy conference, and I think it's one of the one of the world's largest. So, nice. And it's been going on for 50 years. And last year, or uh, two years ago, there were, weren't any topics about nuclear energy. And right. since I've been in the last couple of years, been looking into nuclear and I'm thinking this is a wonderful energy uh, resource that we need to look into. Yeah. Said that, okay, there weren't any on the program two years ago. There, yeah. there has to be something this year. So I reached out and they were super excited to find someone that actually had some contacts and network <laughs> within the nuclear industry. So it was it was very easy. Uh, Fantastic. There, yeah. How's the attendance, total attendance for the conference? I'm not sure about the number this year, but it was 60,000 people vis- visiting wow. last year. That's a lot and of I, energy execs. I mean, that's... It that's is, it is. 1,100 companies Wow, uh, from around the world. And you, I just walk around there, and then there are celebrities and royals every corner. Oh, absolutely! And and so, uh, how long have you lived in Norway? Well, I I grew up in Norway, so okay. I'm I'm Norwegian. So, but I've only <laughs> I've only I've studied a year abroad in Atlanta, in Georgia. Oh, okay. So at uh, Georgia Tech at the industrial system engineering department that was that was a blast fantastic uh, yeah yeah how do you see the political change for you know, Doug was letting me know some of the political things in Norway yeah. how, we're having some of the same political things going on in the US that we were talking yeah. about a second ago yeah. we, Doug and I are very hopeful that we are going to get we have what 100 and some odd reactors in the US 95 yeah. I think somewhere around that range and we've got to get more because our baseline is not going to be covered and if if we can get more reactors like the uae i would love to have more countries follow four years under budget and it's already providing 20 percent of their power that's a real fantastic story but I think you're you're getting very lucky because you have the the Democrats, the energy minister there, had this speech 
for the opening of the Voktel power plant that said, okay, we have built two. Yep. Now we need 198 more to go. <laughs> and I think they, they're from, coming around. They're coming around yeah. because I, I feel it's been a, some sort of a right part of the, the right side of the aisle is much more positive against the positive for, for nuclear. Right. But, and that's exactly the case here in Norway. I think it's the same case in Australia and some other countries as well. Right. But on the, the left side, that's generally where you have the, the labor unions, etc., etc. Right. Somehow have this more opposition against uh, against nuclear, which is and, hard for hard for me to, to fathom how this a cornerstone of a, right. of a industry that would would uh, labor so many people in a local region rather than having if the stuff made in made in China and imported. You, Why don't the the left side of the aisle attribute this this so much here in Norway? And that's why I'm I'm happy that see that the the Democrats in the U.S. have woken up and started to realize that nuclear can play a role in. Well, for our podcast listeners, how do people reach out to you? Is there a LinkedIn address yeah. or pronounce your last name? <laughs> so it's it's my my full name is Martin Yell. It's okay. uh, the H J. So the H is silent in my in my last name, and I'm okay. active on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, I find it's a, a very nice uh, platform to engage with people and have a more uh, open discussion. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, I'll yeah. reach out to you immediately. <laughs> and yeah. again, yeah. thank you so much yeah. for your time. And I want to follow up with you in the future at yeah. any time that you would like to get your story out. If you have anything else, yeah. reach out and let's get a podcast and tell the world what Norway is doing. I think this wonderful. is exciting. Wonderful. So, I would love thank you so much. And thank you for stopping by the podcast. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. You. All right. Uh, Thanks. Uh, we'll do, talk do to you, you want... soon. All right. Hey, hey, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. I'm glad you got to meet Martin. And yes. uh, he, he is a mover and shaker in Norway. I mean, he single-handedly is bringing the dialogue to the people in Norway. And the fact that he found me in Sicily, because he couldn't find any Norwegians to talk oh, about nuclear funny. energy. It's just so fun. And I stayed with his family this week. I babysit his daughter this morning for a little while. Nice. And it's just been it's just been a wonderful well, experience. I, I send me his contact information and we'll put it in the show notes. And again, thank you, Doug. As always, I appreciate everything that you've got going on out there. We'll have your information in the show notes as well, too. All right. Talk to you soon, hey. Stu. Thanks. Bye. Bye.